Hello and welcome to our uh, to back to world history. This is our first lecture together, and uh, we're going to be talking about the Protestant Reformation and its impact around the world. So we're going to we're going to start with the Reformation, and then we're going to talk about how the Reformation and some of the ideas and, and influences and cons or effects of the Reformation and impacted other things that may not even have to do a lot with Christianity, um, but other things around the world. You Friday, you watched a, a crash course on the Renaissance. The key things I want you to remember from that coming into this lecture is that the Renaissance is centered in Italy, and it makes Italy uh, an important point of power, a center of power in Europe. The combination of the wealth of those city-states like Milan and Venice and Florence, right, who are trading with the Ottoman Empire um, as part of that Silk Route trade network that's bringing all those goods into Europe, and of course, goods from Europe, the few goods in Europe that are being demanded in Asia are also going through them, but they're primarily importing all those luxury goods. They're making huge profits off of that. That's making the church, the Catholic church, very rich, um, very powerful, and quite frankly, very lazy and not very Christian. Um, and we'll talk a little about that a little bit. Um, and so, the rest of Europe is not necessarily appreciative of the, the growing wealth and power centered in Italy, um, either the city-states or the church, the Catholic church centered in Rome. And that is, as we've already talked about, why some places like Portugal, England, the Netherlands, etc., they are interested in bypassing Italy and having direct connection to Asia for trade. Now, the Reformation, we usually say, starts with Martin Luther, and that is certainly true. There's no reason not to use Martin Luther as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. There are a couple things that happen in Europe. There are a few people who attempt to make changes to the Roman Catholic Church prior to Martin Luther, and they have limited success, right? Some of the things that Martin Luther, one of the things that Martin Luther does is he believes that the Bible should be written in the local language of the people, rather than in Latin, which very few Europeans could read. Only the educated priests basically could read it. He thought that it should be translated into, for him, German, so that all Germans could read the Bible. That was not an idea new to Martin Luther. That idea had been in uh, Germany before. It had been in England before. And um, for the most part, they had had limited success in getting in having those Bibles translated into their local vernacular or language. So there are some things that happen before Martin Luther that kind of set the stage for the Protestant Reformation. But it is certainly Martin Luther who really kicks off this Reformation and the branch of Christianity that a very large um, sweeping term, the Protestant version of Christianity. So let's talk about those terms real quick. A Reformation, right, is a change. It is a reform movement. And so if we want to reform or we want to change something, we, are, we can talk about a Reformation, particularly if it has taken place. So maybe we want to change um, the college system, or we want to change, or we hear about maybe reformation in our prison system, in our justice system, right? That's what we're talking about. We're just talking about making some changes. The other term, Protestant, comes from the word protest, and so these are protesters, and Martin Luther, John Calvin, Swingley, and others, they are protesters, and they're protesting how the church is working under the leadership of the pope and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. So that is why they are Protestants, they are protesters, and they are participating in this Reformation. They want to change Christianity for the better. They feel that Christianity is not what true Christianity is, it's not what Jesus had wanted, and they are trying to change it 
to make it better and more closely aligned to the teachings of Jesus and the Bible. So, Martin Luther. Um, I, I'm going to assume that many of us are already somewhat familiar with Martin Luther, either from Bible class or from church, etc. But we'll just go over this quickly. So, Martin Luther is a German. He's a German priest. He um, is born into a, basically a middle-class German family. Um, his father tries to get him to go to law school. He does a little bit of law school, but um, he doesn't feel that it's for him, and he ends up in the seminary, um, which is a college to train priests. Luther also has... Um, he struggles with sin. He struggles with feeling that he is not good enough to be saved. And he feels that the teachings of the church are really harsh, right? And so the teachings of the church at this time, by the 1500s, when it comes to um, salvation and sin, is that we are all born with sin. And sin kind of adds up like in a bank account, right? So some sins are worth this many points, other sins are worth that many points. Of course, I'm, I'm generalizing here a little bit. I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit. But it's pretty close to this idea. And so when you sin, you have a debt, in a sense, to God. And you have to pay that debt off to be saved. And you pay that debt off by doing things like praying, participating in Mass, um, or some other big things that you could do, um, like a baptism. And so a baptism kind of covers all your sins, right, um, from when you were a child. And of course, they, Catholics practice child baptism because they believe that children were born with sin. And so a newborn child needed to be baptized early on. They needed to be christened, which is partly what happens, and they can therefore get rid of sin because they're born with sin. They're already born in debt, so to speak. And so there's many things that have to be done to make sure that if the child were to buy an infancy, die in infancy or um, early on, that they are saved. And so you have to do all these things to kind of um, balance your debt and make your balance account zero. And in fact, in some some thinking you could even have a positive account which allow which would allow you to do a little bit of sinning on the side but for luther for martin luther and for most christians they felt that you know when we lived our lives we sin anyways right we have a, a negative thought an evil thought a sinful thought throughout the day at least one or two right even if we don't act on it but those thoughts are sinful so those they may not be big debits right withdrawals from the accounts but they add up over the course of the day and so this weighed on luther and it really weighed him down and so as he studied the scriptures he began to really question this and then of course famously as you may know from the story of luther he is while he is a, a, a pastor and a teacher at another college he encounters uh, another member of the church selling indulgences. And indulgences was one of those ways to kind of cancel that sin debt. And the church had jumped on this because the church was spending a lot of money building like the Sistine Chapel, paying Michelangelo, decorating their churches. Um, quite frankly, <laughs> some of them were using it um, to purchase sex, right? Um, and this really bothered Luther and a lot of other Christians. What are these priests who are supposed to be celibate? They don't get married. Why are they hanging out in brothels and things like this? And these indulgences were helping pay for this type of stuff. Primarily the indulgences that Luther encountered um, were being used to pay for uh, like the system, you know, uh, improvements to churches, the construction of St. Paul's Cathedral in particular. Now, these indulgences, right, you could buy one and it would cover, it would kind of help cover that sin. Um, and you could also, the church had also started to allow you to buy them for other people, like dead, like your dead relatives. So if you're like, hmm, you know, I like Uncle John, but I don't think Uncle John went straight to heaven because, you know, 
Yeah, you know, so maybe he's still in purgatory where he's kind of suffering for some minor sins, the judgment's still going on, right, before a final destination of hell or heaven. Maybe I can help him get to heaven and help cut down time in purgatory, right, kind of time out period, by buying him an indulgence, buying an indulgence in his name. And so you could kind of just pay some money, get this piece of paper, and it would cover some sins. Obviously, there's lots of room for abuse here, and Luther felt that this was just ridiculous. It doesn't make the person remorseful, and as he's reading the scriptures, it becomes very clear to him that the scriptures say that only God can forgive sins. So what is, what is a man, what are we doing saying we can forgive sins? What is the Pope doing saying he can forgive sins? So this leads him to really start questioning the church, and remember, he is a priest in the church, so this is his profession this is his church and he feels that there needs to be change there needs to be change within the roman catholic church he starts in his sermons that he gives he starts touching on these ideas in his lectures that in the classes that he's teaching he starts touching on these ideas that results in uh, someone being invited to kind of re respond to him in the town and that responds and that causes Luther to kind of issue a challenge. And that's what his 93 theses really were. It was a challenge and it was a post of a lecture, right? I challenge someone to debate me on these 95 points. And that's what he nails to the church door in his town of Wittenberg, Germany. And basically it outlines his issues with the Catholic Church. And notice there are a lot, 95 of them. Now, Luther, when he starts, he is not looking to break away from the church. Remember, he is a priest of the Roman Catholic Church. There is only one Christian church. He works for the church. This is in his employer. This is who he loves, right? This institution and the Christianity, he loves this. And he's not looking to destroy it. He's just looking to change it, to make it better, to bring it closer to what he understands to be the teachings of the Bible. So he does this on October 31. 1517. In particular, Luther is critical of these things. He's critical of the church selling church positions. So in particular, the higher up positions within the church, like bishops, these are positions that could be purchased. So rich families could simply purchase these positions. And in fact, some of the families of Italy were well known to purchase um, bishops or cardinalships and even the Pope, right? The voting for the Pope by the cardinals was often influenced and bribed by people paying other people off. And so we have some um, popes who are made popes because their families or they buy the position. Um, the selling of indulgences, I already talked about that, these certificates that are issued by the church, the reduce or cancel punishment for a person's sins, the luxurious life of the popes and other members of the church, and the corruption and immorality of some clergy, particularly those in Italy, and it became a well-known secret, which of course is never a secret, right, of the type of corruption and immorality that these clergymen were participating in, and I already mentioned that. So Luther's critical of these. Luther, again, is believing that the Bible calls us to a holy life, to a life of love, a life of grace, but a life that is holy. In particular, Luther believes that salvation comes through faith alone, not through anything that man can do, that the church can do. It comes through a personal faith in Jesus. God's grace is freely and directly granted to believers. That directly granted is another key idea within the Roman Catholic Church, particularly at this time. It was believed that God's grace was given to the Pope. The Pope then gave some, God's, some of God's grace to the bishops and the archbishops and the cardinals, who then gave it to their local priests, who were then able to give it to individuals. And it was grace that covered sin and kind of canceled out that sin debt. Right, so all these things like indulgences and um, a baptism and a marriage that's blessed by priests and so on, these actually were ways that grace was given to an individual. Martin Luther says, no, grace goes straight from God 
to you. There's no in-between. The other thing that he was strongly, um, that he strongly argued for was religious authority of the Bible, that there was only one religious authority and it was the Bible as interpreted by the individual, not the Pope or the church leaders. Again, the Bible at this time, the only official Bible, the only legal Bible is, a, is written in Latin, right? Most people can't read Latin, so they have to. It forces them to rely on their local priests, their local clergy to interpret the Bible to them, tell them what it says, right? And therefore they can't read the Bible themselves. And basically that means that the Pope and the church leaders become the religious authority and not the Bible. And Luther says, no, the Bible's clear. I feel it's clear that everyone should be reading the Bible for themselves because the Bible is the sole source of authority. Sola Scriptura, if you know that phrase. These, of course, create a massive rift between Luther and the Catholic Church and those who follow Luther the, what, who we will be calling the Protestant version of Christianity. And these are the two key things that separate Catholics and Protestants. Of all the differences among the various Protestant denominations, it is these two, how salvation works and the where authority, religious authority rests. These are the two that um, create this rift between Catholic Christianity and Protestant Christianity. So Luther is, right, he then is, of course, um, challenged by the church. He has to go and defend himself. Um, but in the midst of all of this, a couple of key things happen. His ideas spread fairly quickly within and beyond Germany, thanks to uh, an invention, although the Chinese had a printing press, Johannes Gutenberg designs this one on his own. As far as we can tell, he, hadn't, he didn't have an idea how the Chinese were to, had been doing something like this for a long time. And that's the printing press. And this made copies of Luther's 95 Theses, the many pamphlets that he writes, his German translation of the New Testament, easily and widely available throughout Europe because it is easy to make copies of those. And so the printing press spreads Luther's ideas very quickly. Others join in with Luther and his ideas. Um, and, but they all don't agree. <laughs> they all disagree on something. And so the Protestant movement ends up being a whole bunch of different Protestant churches like the Lutheran Church, who follow Lutheran the most closely, the Calvinist, who follow a man named John Calvin, the Anglican, which is the Church of England, the Quakers, the Anabaptists, the Puritans, and it goes on and on and on. And so there's a whole bunch of small little Protestant churches, and the Catholic Church remains the large church. But Europe gets split. So this Protestant Reformation splinters Europe into Protestants who don't all agree and the Catholic Church. Here we can see kind of how this uh, splintering takes place in the spread in our first <clears throat> map over here. This one here, <coughs> excuse me. We can see that purple is Catholic Green is the Ottoman Empire, which is uh, technically Islamic, but within the Ottoman Empire, there are still a lot of Eastern Orthodox Christians. We can see um, the Protestants, which are kind of that golden rod color. Um, so places like England and Sweden and Norway. And you can see part of what we call Germany today, but at the time was called the Holy Roman Empire, right, is Protestant. And then we have some areas where it's kind of a mix, where the Protestants are not dominant, but there's enough to make note of it. And so and that's in places like Poland, uh, Bohemia, around Vienna, right, the south of France, etc. <clears throat> so we can see this, this fractures Europe, right? So Europe is already in competition 
over access to Asia and economic and the trade with Asia, right? England, Spain, France, Denmark, which is the Netherlands, they're already in competition. And now here's just another thing that divides Europe and reinforces that each small little part of Europe, England, Spain, France, Denmark, etc., <clears throat> need to continue to kind of go it on their own. Um, and the last thing to point out, right, is this fractures the Holy Roman Empire the most, right? So the Holy Roman Empire outlined by that purple line here, I'm going to try and use purple as well here, right, this area right in here, we can see that the Holy Roman Empire is significantly fractured with the south, uh, southwestern portion of the Holy Roman Empire remaining primarily Catholic, whereas in north, the northern Holy Roman Empire, what is the core of Germany today, becomes Protestant, right? So here is Wittenberg, where Luther was. And just for some reference, here's Worms, where he goes on trial, right? And you can see that this whole area remains or, or becomes Protestant, I should say. In addition, there's a little bit of Protestantism right here in the what at that time was called the Swiss Confederation, what today we would identify as Switzerland. Our second map over here. It's just uh, zoomed in. We can see right here that even within the Protestant tradition, right? So uh, there's a lot of variants. So in our first map, everything was just identified as Protestant or Catholic. Here we can see within Protestantism, though, there are a lot of variations. So Lutherans are primarily in northern Germany and in Norway and Sweden. Let's see if the red will show up, right? So that's Lutherans over there. Reformed Calvinists, kind of that light blue, right? There's pockets of them and in Scotland. So even the Great Britain is divided between <clears throat> to the north, Reformed or Calvinist, and then to the south, Anglican. Um, Roman Catholic is in this kind of burgundy color, Orthodox we see in purple, and a little bit of Islam there. So here we just have a couple being called, pointed out, Lutheranism, Calvinism, and Anglicanism. Um, but those three still divide that Protestant areas of Europe into smaller divisions. So that's Lutheranism. Um, Luther, um, before I talk about Calvin just a little bit, Luther, to finish up Luther's quick story, Luther, um, after he basically is found guilty of heresy at Worms, he um, is able to kind of escape prison and he hangs out with some friends that he had made who are powerful princes in the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> the Holy Roman Empire is this collection of small princedoms or kingdoms and he, um, he hangs out with some who support him. Um, and they support him partly for religious reasons. They truly believe what he has to say and partly because it is politically, um, uh, politically advantageous for them in their position because they are against certain policies and um, siding with Luther. And if Luther's vision of Christianity comes to place, it would enrich them. So Luther um, basically spends the rest of his life protected. He's a wanted man, but he's protected in northern Germany by these princes. Um, Lutheranism becomes, again, the dominant Protestant religion in northern Germany and then into Norway and Sweden. To the south in Switzerland, we have another Protestant emerging by the name of John Calvin. He uh, teaches, similar to Luther, right? He believes um, grace is given directly to the individual. He also believes that the Bible should be in the vernacular of the people. But he also, his unique teaching is predestination. Predestination 
in its basic form is that God has determined the fate of every person before they're born. So God already knows, and, and well, I should say God has already determined who is saved and who is not saved even before they're born. That is different. Note that that is different than God knowing if you're saved, if you're going to be saved or not in the future. It is God has already determined that. So when God, right, uh, for instance, during creation week, God was already like, oh, yeah, in uh, you know 2019, Mr. Jones is going to have a daughter, Eleanor, and she's not going to be saved or whatever. I, I don't believe that. And I'm just making that up. But that's essentially what's taking place. The thing is, is that people don't know if they are saved or not. So they have to live their life as if they are saved. And people who are saved live a particular life. And John Calvin was very particular and very clear about the specific things that a saved person would do and how you could, therefore, by their actions and how they live their life, you can kind of tell if they're saved or not. So this is actually ends up being a very structured, a very rigid, rigid, excuse me, um, society and Christianity uh, with this predestination. But predestination is the key teaching, uh, the, key, the key unique teaching of Calvinism. In, primarily in France, there's another group of Protestants that emerges called the Anabaptists. Now the Anabaptists are often, see, have been seen by the Adventist church as a great, um, as one of our forefathers in Adventism, right? They start preaching certain Adventist beliefs that make Adventism unique in Christianity and in Protestantism. And we trace some of those back to the Anabaptists. Um, the first one that I've listed here is not necessarily one, but it is uh, that is one that is uh, the Adventists have embraced. But it is one that Anabaptists traditionally have embraced, and that is denying the authority of local governments. So members of the Anabaptist Protestant movement refuse to hold office. They refuse to bear arms. Now that one sounds kind of like Adventism, or swear oaths, which actually Adventism has played with as well in its history. What kind of oath do we swear? Right, Mrs. White and even the Bible advise us not to swear oaths. Um, and so, so for instance, some Anabaptists have said, well, that means that like, right in a, in a courtroom, when you're asked to put your hand on the Bible and raise, right, put your left hand on the Bible and raise your, sorry, put your right hand on the Bible and raise your left hand and then solemnly swear to tell the truth that you wouldn't do that. You would do something else, not to swear an oath. Um, <clears throat> so, they deny the authority of local governments. Of course, this is going to make them <laughs> um, a, a bit of a thorn in the side of local governments when they're trying to get people to, for instance, bear arms. Because remember back here in the 1600s, armies were primarily the local farmers, citizens, right, who were asked to carry a weapon and go fight. Um, and so there's no standing army. It's just, oh, war's coming. You need to go fight. Um, holding office, not as big of a deal, but swearing oaths, again, another big deal, particularly in the judicial system. And so this marked them as unique. This marked them as separate from the rest of society. And primarily the Anabaptists, again, are in Switzerland and even more predominantly in uh in southern France. So many of them end up living separate from society. They viewed the modern world as sinful and they needed to remove themselves and live in their own communities under their own uh, social structures um, because they were trying to, to be sinless. And the other key teaching of Anabaptists and where they get their name is that they chose to baptize adult members only. And this is one of those key um, Adventist beliefs and teachings, um, right, that we don't participate in child baptism or infant bat baptism. The Anabaptists believed that in order to be, in order to accept Jesus as your savior, which is what baptism is about, you needed to be an adult who could make that decision on your own. And therefore they didn't necessarily believe in predestination. They didn't believe in this idea that, right, that if a child dies, they're gonna be full of sin and probably not saved. 
um, they believe that God's grace would cover that until that person can make that conscious choice to follow and accept Jesus and therefore be baptized as an adult. They also practiced immersion baptism, as we see here in the picture, where you are completely, your body is completely immersed in water. Again, something that Adventists practice, and therefore it's one of those traditions and one of those beliefs that we trace back to the Anabaptists of the Protestant Reformation. All right, so we've covered a couple very briefly. We've talked a little bit about Lutheranism as a Protestant strain. We've talked about Calvinism as a Protestant strain. We've now talked about Anabaptists as a Protestant strain. Politically, though, um, Anglicanism is probably the most important of the Protestant strains because Anglicanism becomes a the uh, shows the rest of Europe the Protestantism can survive in Europe. Um, with most monarchies being aligned with the Church uh, with the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church and the experience of England under um, King Henry the eighth and then going forward demonstrates to the rest of Europe that it is possible to be a powerful European nation in Europe and not be tied to the Catholic Church. So we're going to spend a couple minutes here talking about the Church of England and how it gets started. Unlike and the Anabaptists, unlike the Lutheran churches, unlike Calvinism, the Church of England is started primarily for political gain and personal <laughs> and personal uh, <laughs> to solve some personal problems of the monarch, King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII, right, who rules England from 1509 to 1547, he ends up wanting a divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Now, Catherine is the daughter of the King of Spain. So she is a princess, a Spanish princess. And Spain at this time in the 15, in the mid 1500s or the early 1500s, Spain is very powerful, right? If we think back to our discussion about Columbus and our discussion about the Colombian exchange, Spain is the one that's benefiting from all the silver and gold that's being extracted from the Americas. Um, they have emerged as the most powerful nation in, in at least Europe for sure. Um, they are flooding the markets of China with gold and silver, um, and they are exerting control over the Roman Catholic Church. They're also related to most other, as we can see right even here on our slide, they're related to basically all other monarchs in Europe, um, either through marriage or their cousins or whatever. So wanting a divorce from the daughter of the most powerful kingdom in Europe is a bit of a tricky situation for King Henry. Now, fortunately for Henry, he was bullheaded and he really didn't think things through. He just decided he wanted something and went ahead with it and hoped for the best. Um, but he, he did understand that this was going to be a difficult situation. Um, divorce was seen as a sin. And although monarchs often were granted special, um, a special, well, basically they were granted special privileges by the church and granted divorces pretty much when they wanted to, it technically was not something that should happen. Divorce was seen as a sin. And really the only grounds for a divorce was um, adultery. And so the person seeking the divorce would have to prove that the other person was adulterous. Or you had to prove that the marriage was illegal to begin with. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that, why, how marriage could be illegal here in a moment. So Henry, ends up deciding that he wants a divorce. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, he wants a son. Um, pretty bad. Henry is the son of 
Henry VIII is the son of Henry VII, and Henry VII comes to the throne uh, by defeating another family and claiming the throne of England um, from another family. This is during the War of the Roses, what's called the War of the Roses. And so Henry is very aware that his position as king and his family line as king is very tedious because quite frankly it was. Uh, he and his father were claiming to be king through no direct descent of prior king. It was, um, there was some divorce involved, there were some cousins. It was a pretty thin claim, but his father had defeated the other claimant to the throne on the battlefield and had begun to solidify his rule in England and Henry had watched his father do this. He knew the situation he was in. And so he knew in order to secure his claim to the throne and his family's claim to the throne, he was going to need a son, a male heir. And so he desperately wanted one. So that's the first thing. <clears throat> and so far they had only had one child, a girl whose name was Mary. The other thing that Henry, um, the other reason Henry was not too excited about his marriage to Catherine, A, right, no son, but B, Catherine was older than he was um, by several years. Catherine had actually been married to his older brother. So Henry had an older brother that older brother had been betrothed to Catherine. They were about the same age, and when they were very young, six or seven, eight, I don't remember the exact age, um, they were betrothed, and then a little bit later, they were married. Now, that is fairly common among the royalty, among the ruling families of Europe at the time, to have their children marry, particularly their eldest children marry, because it helps solidify these alliances, these political alliances in Europe. But that makes her older. It does make her his brother's wife. And so as he got older, he wasn't too excited about this because actually when his brother died very young, um, again, his brother dying when he was like 13 or so, um, not, um, you know, then Henry, Henry's parents, his dad, and then Catherine's parents, they agreed that the two of them will get married. And so he didn't have much of a say in it. Um, she was older. And then the, the last reason is quite frankly, Henry just, he, he liked lots of women and he had a hard time remaining faithful and committed to one woman. So, um, so Henry and Catherine, they, right, they do get married, they do have children. They actually have six children, but only one of them survives um, infancy, and that's a girl named Mary. I've touched on King uh, Henry wanting a male heir. I touched on Catherine being too old, right? And so this plays into, well, maybe she's too old to give me a son. As they've already had six children, five of them dying, now he's starting to think, well, maybe I need a younger woman and there ends up being a younger woman in the court. She is one of um, Queen Catherine of Aragon's handmaidens. And uh, King Henry likes her, finds her beautiful, lusts after her, and eventually um, is able to convince her um, to, to like him back. So. Henry says, okay, so here's the plan. I'm going to divorce Catherine, and I'm going to marry Anne Boleyn, this person that he's fallen in love with, or at least in lust with. Well, the Pope, who's related to the King of Spain and doesn't want to right, anger the King of Spain, refuses the divorce. This angers Henry, as we might imagine. So Henry decides to find a course of action to divorce Catherine 
and Mary Anne Boleyn. Now in his court, meaning some of his advisors and government officials, he has a small group of them who have been following what's been taking place in Germany, right? In 1517, just a few years before. Now, when Luther, just as a side note, an interesting side note, when Luther writes his 95 theses and, and posts them on the door of the church there, Henry VIII, who by no means was a scholar, he sat down and he wrote a letter of opposition defending the Catholic Church, and in response, the, same, the Pope grants him a special title, title defender of the faith. But he has in his court those who are sympathetic to the Protestant Reformation, and they are sympathetic, many of them are sympathetic because they believe in the teachings, right? They believe that the church is wrong about its teachings, and they sincerely believe in the teachings of Luther, things like sola scriptura, the sole authority of the Bible, things like grace, direct connection to um, God, the people having direct connection to God and God's grace, or the, the priesthood of believers, as it's called, um, and these types of things. So he has these people in his court. So he's angry, of course, when the Pope denies his divorce. He, uh, uh, he then actually argues that... Um, that his brother and Catherine um, completed the marriage. Um, you can figure out what that means. And therefore, um, he the, the marriage to Catherine is never legal. Um, he came up with a whole bunch of arguments for this, but the answer was always no. And so as he's going through this, those who are in his court suggest to him that maybe he should think about re changing the church, right? And maybe he should join forces with Protestants, or at least go down the path of Protestantism. Um, and one of them suggests that this would make him the head of the church, and then he could kind of make the rules. And so he decides to go down this path. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who are against this. There are a lot of people saying this is a bad idea because when you do this, you're going to be declared a heretic. You're going to be, the Pope is going to excommunicate you. The other powers of Europe, the kings of France and Spain, the, king, uh, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, they're all going to be against you. In fact, the Pope may ask for a crusade against you as a heretic and, and a threat to Christianity in Europe. Um, but Henry decides to go along with this, and he likes the idea, of course, that this is going to get him a divorce from Catherine, and therefore he can marry Anne. Now, he needs to marry Anne so that his son is legitimate, right? Legally legitimate, and therefore can be um, the next king. So they do this. He makes himself the head of a new church in England called the Church of England. We also call it the Anglican Church. But Henry a man of tradition, and again, he's doing this not because he sincerely believes that the Roman Catholic Church is wrong in all of its teachings about Christianity, he just believes that in this case he didn't get what he wanted, and therefore he made a new church so that he could get the divorce he wanted. So the Church of England, particularly early on, looks almost exactly like a Roman Catholic Church, right? The services are the same, the words are the same, very little changes. So most of the Catholic practices and traditions are kept. The only difference is now the king is king, Henry VIII, is head of the church instead of the pope in Italy. He does have some supporters of the old religion, the Catholic religion, killed. Again, this is more... Um, this is not because he believes so much that they have the wrong belief. He believes that they are a threat to his new right church and to his kingship, his monarchy and his kingdom. They are spies for the Pope. They are there to subvert his rule, to convince the people to turn against him. And he's already fighting a hard battle because people don't like change. And when the king just says, oh, your religion is wrong, we're going to try a new one, people are not too sure about that. And so he has a lot of, this is a very unstable time for him. And so he does seek out some supporters, not a lot, but some supporters of the old religion, particularly vocal 
Catholics who are opposed to him, who have some power, so nobles, lords, etc., who have power, who are opposed to it, who are vocal about it, who, who seem to be stirring up resistance to him, he has them killed. So Henry has his marriage to Catherine end in a divorce. The church then blesses his marriage to Anne, and Anne gets pregnant with a girl. She's born, they name her Elizabeth. Um, but after that, um, Henry is a little anxious that another child doesn't come. He also believes that Anne has had an affair with someone else. And so he, mm, right, he moves on again. And now, since he can decide <laughs> if the divorce is legal or not, according to the church, he ends up marrying four more times. He only gets one son out of all these marriages, and that son's name is Edward. So he now has three children who have survived through infancy. He has Mary from Catherine, he has Elizabeth from Anne, and he has Edward. Edward is a son, and so Edward becomes king when Henry does die. Now, Edward, unfortunately, right, Henry dies um, when Edward is quite young. And so Edward comes to the throne in his early teenage years. He is a sickly boy, and he dies after about five years on the throne. Edward is raised, again, his mother is not in the picture for very long. So Edward is raised by a group of advisors, government officials to King Henry. And it happens to be that those government officials are very Protestant in their thinking. And they feel that the church, now that the church is broken from, the church in England is broken from Rome, the church needs to move and teach and, and embrace the teachings of people like Calvin and others and become a much more radical and much different looking church than simply a church that looks just like the Roman Catholic Church, but isn't but the head is the English monarch instead of the Pope. So he's raised with that group. And so when he comes to the throne in his early teenage years, right, he moves his advisors and him move the church in that direction. And so they start doing things like breaking out the stained glass windows, taking out the organs, getting rid of all the fancy looking stuff in the churches. And the churches turn from music and stained glass and something that is maybe enjoyable for the, for the common person, right? At least there's lots of visual stimulus to a very boring, <laughs> quite frankly, a very boring gray building with two hour long sermons and very and some music at the beginning and the end rather than all the pageantry of a Catholic service. Not particularly popular, and it does mean that the people who oppose this move are executed. But again, Edward only lives for about five years once he becomes king. <clears throat> he, is, <coughs> he had been a very sickly boy his whole life and he dies. This creates a bit of a problem. Who is going to succeed Edward? Is it going to be Henry's eldest daughter, Mary, who had been in Spain, right? Once the divorce with Catherine took place, Catherine took Mary and returned to Spain and raised Mary in Spain. So she's raised a Catholic and she is closely tied to the Spanish throne. Or are they going to perhaps turn to Elizabeth, who is younger than Mary? Or do they need to find another boy, maybe look for a cousin or something like that? There's a lot of discussion, but <coughs> The consensus emerges that it will be Mary who will be the next monarch of England. So she is crowned queen. This, of course, is a problem. She is Catholic. <laughs> so we have a Catholic queen in charge of a kingdom that has a church that is no longer Catholic and that is under 
um, is under threat from the rest of Europe because they're not Catholic. So the rest of Europe and the church thinks this is a great idea. Catholic queen, she's going to return the church to the Roman, or the Church of England, and return it to the to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Universal Church, and this little experiment in a Protestant church in England is going to end. She seeks out all those who were Protestants, particularly those who are vocal and visible, and she executes them. Again, she is not the only one who does this, right? Her brother had done some of that. Her father had done some of this as well. She, though, because she is Catholic and it is, and she does not succeed, right, long term, she picks up the nickname <coughs> Bloody Mary uh, for everyone that she executes. But again, that's probably an unfair nickname. She, although she did kill a few more, she did kill more than her father or her siblings. It wasn't like she killed hundreds of times more. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so, sorry. It wasn't like she killed hundreds times more than her siblings or her father. But she does pick up this name, Bloody Mary, for the executions that she carries out in an attempt to restore England to the Catholic Church and to root Protest Protest Protestantism out of England. She dies after only about five years of being queen. Again, this throws England into a bit of a of chaos and a conundrum. What are we going to do? But Elizabeth, the youngest, sorry, not the youngest, but the youngest daughter of Henry, is crowned queen. Elizabeth has been watching most of this from, uh, from uh, kind of in hiding in the north where she was kind of out of sight from Henry so that she wouldn't be kind of <laughs> a reminder to Henry of her mother. Um, she also was there when Edward took the throne, again, not to be, so that she wouldn't be seen as a threat, and she kind of ducked her head and was able to, although Mary, her sister, did <clears throat> chase after her and see her as a threat, particularly since Elizabeth was raised as a Protestant, um, <clears throat> she was able to keep her head on her shoulders. And so when Mary dies, she becomes queen. Elizabeth takes the approach. <clears throat> Sorry. I, excuse me. It's a long lecture. My throat is, my voice is not holding up. Um, so we're going to end here. We're almost done with um, what we're going to do today. So Elizabeth has grown up watching all this, and she decides that the best course of action is to take a middle road. She personally believes in the teachings of the Protestants, right? She believes that the church um, should be more open to uh, the individual people being able to read the Bible, um, right? That although the Eucharist is a good tradition to practice, just like Adventists practice communion. That's our version of it. We don't think anything actually happens. It's just a symbol. She believes that as well. So it's an important symbol to keep. <clears throat> but it actually doesn't do anything like at the time, the Roman Catholics taught that the, the bread actually turned into the body of Christ when you put it in your mouth <clears throat> and the wine actually turned into Jesus's actual blood through some transformation right so <clears throat> she doesn't believe those so personally she is a protestant but for her for her rule she decides to take a middle of the road approach <clears throat> traditions of the roman catholic church will, will remain many of them will remain so that people feel like they're still worshiping the way they have been, the way their parents have been, the way their grandparents have been, right? The way the English have been worshiping for hundreds of years. Um, but some of the key teachings are going to change. And so it's going to be a middle of the road. There are going to be those who feel that a middle of the road approach is no good, and they're going to end up being called Puritans and radical Protestants. They want to purify the English church of all of its Catholic elements. Um, 
there are going to be those who feel that the church needs to return to to Rome, um, like what Mary had proposed. And so she's going to have opponents on both sides. And Elizabeth also executes people who are opponents to her. Again, typically those who are the most vocal, those who are the most visible, um, those who go too far in questioning her authority and power. So she finds this middle road, and it actually pleases most people. The, she is, it becomes a very popular, very popular queen in England. Um, the masses love her. Most of the powerful lords and nobles, a majority of them support her. <clears throat> she is a great politician in giving people what they want, keeping as many people happy as possible in all realms, including their religious beliefs and practices in Anglicanism, which is what it comes to be called, the Church of England. It comes to be called Anglicanism. With that, I'm going to show you our slide where we're going to pick up um, for the next part of lecture. We're going to now look at what this means across Europe in the form of religious conflicts, but for now, we are done.